Welcome, friends, to a special aspect presentation in the Prophecy Odyssey series. And I'm so glad to see each of you here. We just put this program together in two days. We didn't know if anybody would come. And so bless your hearts that you came early for this special program. And I want to welcome our friends who are watching. We, at the last mo minute, decided to stream this live on AFTV, and it's on the Internet so others can enjoy. Uh, if you are tuning in, this is a special series of prophecy studies from New York City called Prophecy Odyssey. And in the course of our first seven or eight presentations, I made a few references to my personal testimony, and some people said, Pastor Doug, why don't we take some time? We had a little extra time. We had the building reserved to go ahead and share your testimony. And so that's how this all came together. And I hope you'll pray for me as I do share with you because, you know, there's always a risk when you take so much time and you talk about yourself that instead of glorifying God, you could glorify yourself. And um, you certainly don't want to glorify sin. And there's a risk that you can sometimes, like a fisherman, the fish keeps getting bigger every time you tell the story. It's like the, uh, you know, the girl in eighth grade, she had to do a book report on Abraham Lincoln. And she wanted to make a big impression. So when she stood before her class, she said, Abraham Lincoln was born at a very early age in a log cabin that he built with his own hands. So we don't want it to be bigger than life. And I, I always like to start with the Word of God because that's what it's all about. And so I want to direct you to a story in the Bible. You actually find it in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's a story I titled Broken Chains. And if you look in Mark chapter 5, I'll read this to you, and then I'm going to jump to Luke quickly. Jesus has just calmed the sea during a storm on Galilee. The next morning, he directs the boat, and the disciples row over towards the southeastern shore of Galilee. And they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, no, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces, and neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. Now go to Luke. Dr. Luke adds a few little aspects to the story that Mark doesn't mention. Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, it is opposite Galilee, and when he stepped out on land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house but in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out, and he fell down before him. And with a loud voice, he said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he, Jesus, had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles. And he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now, I share this story because I, in some ways, I feel like I can relate to this man. You know, everybody is looking for happiness. And many people in the world, they think that happiness comes from, from fame and fortune. And um, in reality, if we are not serving the Lord, we are bound by the devil. This man that we just read about is the most lost person in the Bible. 
You cannot find an example of anyone in the Bible whose condition is more hopeless than this man. Just look at this. He's running around in the mountains naked, living with the dead. You read on, it says, surrounded by pigs. He's got a cutting problem. Have you heard of that before? Cutting himself with stones, always crying, dragging broken manacles and pieces of chains around his wrists and his ankles and his neck, scarred, blood. By the way, if you're a Jew and you read this story, pigs are unclean, blood is unclean, tombs and death are unclean. This story is saying to any Jewish reader, unclean, 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 filled with not just a devil, a legion of demons. Can you find anybody in the Bible whose condition looks more hopeless? But this man came to Jesus, and it changed everything. You know, I sometimes feel like I can relate to that story because I was running around naked in the mountains living like an animal. And it didn't start that way, but it grew into that. You know, little by little, the devil can come into our lives as we give him permission until we feel like our whole lives are controlled by the enemy and you wonder, is there any way out? Now, let's get back to basics. Everybody wants happiness. Jesus wants you to have an abundant life. But the problem is most people in the world think happiness comes from the wrong things. They think if I had more money, I'd be happy. And a lot of us think a little more would help, right? Or if I was better looking or more popular or more talented, then I'd be happy. And I want to tell you, that's not true. I had some very unusual parents. I didn't realize it until I kind of got out in the world how unusual it was. But uh, that's a picture of my mother and my father, uh, George and Ruth Batchelor. They were not married very long, six years. During that time, they had two sons, my brother and I, my brother... His name is Falcon. My name is Douglas. My father was in the aviation business, and he was very successful. He was a pilot during World War II. He flew during D-Day. He was a pilot before the war, so he was an officer when he entered the Air Corps, and he was decorated. After the war, he began to buy and sell. You know, there's just a great surplus of aircraft after the war. He started buying and selling airplanes until he owned controlling interest in two airlines. He was friends, I should really say, competitors with Howard Hughes and some of the other millionaires. He was very wealthy, very successful, had a lot of money. He was a workaholic. Here's just a few of many clippings I could show. George Batchelor, international air leases. He not only owned Batch Air, they repaired airlines, Aero Airways, Capital Airlines, controlling interest. Anyone remember Western Airlines? Some of these were merged and bought out again. And um, lived on an island in Miami Beach. Here's the new Miami. George Batchelor, Miami's Mr. Aviation. He had all the toys of millionaires. That's his yacht. That's not just a picture of a yacht. That's his yacht. By the way, it was called the Bachelor Party. This is the inside. I've been on it many times. One day, the plug broke. They walked out in the harbor, and the yacht had sunk. Can you imagine that? A multi-million dollar investment went down. But my father was, he was, in, uh, he was a, a thrill junkie in a sense. He was not afraid, you know, a pilot. And he used to water ski. He, we, had, we had three boats in the backyard when I grew up. My dad had a large fishing boat. We had a ski boat. I had a sailboat. That was in the backyard in Miami Beach. He lived on an exclusive island. My father raced cars. That's my dad, one of his race cars. And uh, he just, he loved adventure. Had all the toys that you think would bring happiness. In our garage, at one point or another, Jaguar, Lamborghini, Mercedes-Benz, Ferrari, Rolls-Royce, Surely we must have been happy. No. This is my dad with wife number three out of five. She was a very nice lady. She was Miss Kentucky. 
And when she divorced him, you probably heard of someone named Donald Trump. When Donald Trump's wife, was it um, Avanya, divorced him, she got a minimal settlement of like 14 million because she had signed a prenuptial agreement. When Betty divorced dad, it was the largest divorce settlement in Florida history. So my father had a lot of money. Here's a Miami Herald business. This is uh, 1992. You can't read it, so I'll read it to you. I can see it from here. At 71, aviation pioneer George Batchelor is not ready to descend. He runs one of Miami's most successful businesses, pilots jets, races cars, water skis, and is soon to take a bride age 29. He was 71. My new mother-in-law was younger than my wife. <laughs> but it gets better than that. Now I know this is going to, the ladies are going to go, now how did that work? My father's mother-in-law was younger than me. He had a brother-in-law that was 11 years old. Complicated family. Friends, we could have had a reality show <laughs> in the Bachelor family during this time. Here's a continuation of that same ma magazine. At 71, Bachelor going on 16. And it's got one of his planes from Aero Airlines behind him. But you know, everybody has trouble. My father's first wife and son, his name was Patrick, died in a plane crash. And it was one of his planes. The pilot flew into a mountain. And um, some of you remember in Gander, New Finland, New Year's Eve, a plane full of Marines was flying home. It took off and it blew up a DC-8. And everyone wondered if it was frost on the wings. Years later, they closed their investigation. It was blown up but you never heard much about it. They put a bomb on the plane in Egypt. It finally exploded just on takeoff. A lot of tragedy in the life. My brother, Falcon, had cystic fibrosis, born with a terminal lung disease. And so you think, well, if I had money, I wouldn't have problems. Everybody's got problems. And my father only had two sons, blood sons. I had a stepbrother that survived, and it was me and my brother. Falcon has since passed away. It, you know, Falcon and I, it was so different because we're the same height, same weight. Um, he had brown eyes, I have blue eyes. He had freckles, I didn't. He had flaming red hair, I had no hair. <laughs> we were named after airplanes. He was named Falcon. He got teased a lot because you have the name Falcon Bachelor. I was at least named after the DC craft, Douglas McDonald. So, you know, it's, you can find that on a keychain at Walmart. It's not that bad. This is my father with wife number four, who was younger than my wife. And uh, Karen took this picture that way. My brother, his wife, Sandy. Here's my dad with Pope John Paul II. And you think, oh, how do you meet the Pope? If you donate $2 million, anyone can meet the Pope. It's not that hard. I don't know if you remember back in 2000, the Pope had a jubilee, and my father donated $2 million worth of jets to fly everybody around, and he got to meet the Pope. And that's, uh, again, wife number four, who was Italian and spoke Italian. But you know what? All that money, my father had to drink himself to sleep every night. Slept with a gun under his pillow because he had so many enemies. Karen, my wife Karen is a physical therapist. I don't know if I mentioned that. And he had so much stress. She was trying to work the knots out in his neck. You know what Jesus said? What profit is it to a man if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? Or what is a man advantaged if you have all of these things? A man's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Because the Bible says, thieves break through and steal. Moth and rust does corrupt. If you're going to have treasure, where do you want to store your treasure? In heaven, friends. That's the only thing that lasts. So I saw growing up, a lot of my friends, they had a lot of money. A lot of my friends and their families had a lot of money, but there wasn't happiness. 
Now, on the other side, my mother, my father had been raised a Baptist, but by the time of World War II, he saw so much death and destruction, he thought, if there's a loving God, then why would this happen? And he pretty much became agnostic or atheist. Though he did steal a Gideon Bible once, he told me, during a crisis, and he was trying to find some answers. Can you imagine that? Multimillionaire, he steals a Bible out of a hotel room. My mother, she was Jewish, Ruth Batchelor, and uh, that's my brother and I. Wasn't I cute? As a kid. And she, she wrote songs for Elvis Presley. She was a film critic. She was an actress. My mother was very talented. She dropped out of high school, but she, she had a gift for music, and she kind of taught herself to, to write songs and to play the guitar, and she knew the right people, and she was a beautiful woman. And it, she grew up in New York City. My, my family, grandfather, they all lived in New York City. And she moved to California where she met my dad. He started his business in Burbank. And she was making her way in show business as a film critic. My mother was a leader in the women's lib movement in New York City. That's her marching. And she actually wrote a series of songs on women's lib. She wrote songs on astrology. All of our friends in Hollywood were into the occult and witchcraft. And does anyone remember the TV program called Dark Shadows? Yeah, those people were all friends of our family. They were at our house. And uh, we lived on 81st Street. Some of you remember Lloyd Bridges, who had the diving show. He lived upstairs from us. His sons, Bo Bridges, Jeff Bridges, we used to see them as when we were kids. And, and Red Buttons Academy Award winner, good friends of our family, lived on the corner. And his wife, Alicia, and his daughter, Amy, we knew. I mean, so we grew up knowing, knowing a lot of these people that were in show business because my mother was not only a songwriter, an actress, a film critic, um, but um, she was a playwright, had some programs off-Broadway, she founded the L.A. Film Critics, a very powerful position. Because, you know, when a film critic, producers put millions into a movie. Those first reviews can make the difference in millions of dollars. And if the critics say, I wouldn't waste my money, they lose millions. So they were always sending their gifts and rewards and free cruises and restaurant tickets and a very powerful position as president of the L.A. Film Critics. She replaced Rona Barrett, if you ever remember that name, on Good Morning America. She would do the Hollywood reports. It was called Ruth Bachelor's Hollywood. And she was an actress, but usually they were small parts in big movies. She was in The Ten Commandments, and she was in another movie, The Buccaneer with Yul Brynner and Charlton Heston. But her real success was as a film critic. Now, some people think you tell these stories, you're just making things up. So I'm just going to show you a few pictures of my mom with some of the people that she knew. Anyone know Paul McCartney? <clears throat> Sir Paul McCartney? Sylvester Stallone. I've got a lot of other pictures, but they're dead, and you might not know. So I do these youth programs, and the kids have no idea who Frank Sinatra is. So I show the ones that are still alive. This is Natalie Wood. She's passed away since. Roger Moore was one of the James Bond. That's mom with each one of these people. Sally Field, Clint Eastwood, Dustin Hoffman, Paul Newman, Muhammad Ali. So people in Hollywood knew my mother. And we knew a lot of these people. Sometimes Karen and I will be seeing something on television. I'll say, oh yeah, I know them. And I'll start telling. She'll say, you ruin it for me. Don't talk about it. But you know what? We had friends that were rich and famous and healthy and handsome, and they killed themselves. I had a friend that was a famous child actor. He locked himself in the garage in West Hampton, turned on the car, and killed himself. Had money, talent, good looks, empty. Saw no purpose in life. And so, I saw money doesn't, or happiness doesn't come from fame. So many of these people, they just weren't happy. A lot of drugs in Hollywood, if you didn't know that. You wonder why so many of them, they get married and divorced, some of them are unhappy. When mom died, even though everybody knew her, only ones there, Karen and I, my grandparents. A man's life does not come from the abundance of things he possesses. If you are going to be famous, be famous before God. 
It's Amen. not what people think of you. It's what God thinks of you Amen. that makes the difference. Well, as I mentioned, I grew up in New York City. Here's an old shot where the World Trade Center was still there. And, and uh, I was born in Burbank, California. I hope you'll forgive me, though I did grow up in New York City. Mom and dad divorced when I was three years old. And uh, mom was married four times. Dad was married five times. A lot of intrigue in the family. Mom had an affair for 20 years with a married man and I had to act like I didn't know who he was when I saw his wife. <laughs> I tell you, friends, you have no idea. <laughs> but when my brother and I learned way too much because when we were kids in New York City, mom would say, go play on the streets. And my brother and I, seven, eight, nine years old, we all rode the subway. Back then, the kids all, we rode the bus. Sometimes we'd pay, we'd get on the bus. Sometimes we'd hop on the back. Any of you remember that? Hop on the back and grab the edge of the window. I hope you didn't fall off. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And there were gangs on the streets, and, and uh, we would go play at 42nd and Broadway. And it was pretty seedy back then. Any of you remember the Penny Arcades? You go on there and play skee ball. And, and so my mother just sent us out on the streets, and we learned way too much, way too young. But my parents had money. Not mom so much as dad, but uh, I, because they moved and for a while dad had custody, then mom had custody, and then they sent us to live with our grandparents, and then they sent us to boarding school. I went to 14 different schools by ninth grade. First military school, Black Fox Military Academy, I was five years old. And because my parents were so driven, they would send us to summer camp. Just whatever they could do to get us out of the way. And so we got sent off, and here's my brother and I at summer camp, and there I'm at New York Military Academy. Some of you have heard of that. By the way, that's where Donald Trump went. That was not a political statement. Karen says, don't say that, just a fact. <laughs> and um, that's a friend of mine named Bobby Boyer there. I reconnected with him after 50 years. He saw my TV programs. And you know, he called up our Amazing Facts office. He says, is Doug there? Tell him Bobby's calling. And I not only went to military schools, then I got into trouble in the summers. Now, let me tell you kind of how that happened. One day, my mother, mom and dad both smoked and drank, and mom used other things. A lot of people in Hollywood use drugs. And um, one day, she said, she rolled a joint, and she said, Doug, I know you're going to run into this out there on the street. Of course, I already had. She said, I just assume you did it at home. So she started smoking pot with me. And it became a regular thing that, you know, two or three times a week at night, she'd want to let me do it before school. We'd smoke pot and eat ice cream. It was our bonding time. Well, at this point, my brother had been sent to live with my father because of his lung disease. The New York climate was not good for cystic fibrosis. And then Falcon would come to visit, and he'd see Mom and I smoking pot, and he said, that's not fair. I can't smoke pot. And she said, I'm going to make you some hashish cookies. So my mother would make marijuana hashish cookies for my brother. And we took some to school one day and gave them to the teachers. <laughs> and said, you're going to like this. My mom's got a special recipe. They're really good to get the teachers to loosen up a little bit. <laughs> so I was a real troublemaker. I got into a lot of trouble. And, uh, you know, I, I used to think about suicide. Because going to all these schools, even though I went to Jewish schools, I went to, when I was here, mom sent me to Jewish schools to make my father mad, and then I'd go live with dad, he'd send me to Catholic schools. And he wasn't Catholic. But I never really knew about God. I was, I thought, you die, you turn into fertilizer. And I used to think about suicide all the time. I thought, money doesn't bring happiness. Most people are unhappy. I had friends that had committed suicide. Now, why not just end it all? I felt like my parents didn't really love me because they kept sending me away. And so I was always fantasizing what would be the best way to kill yourself. And living here in New York, you know, there's some tall buildings. I'd climb up on the roof. They'd leave the roof open. I'd climb up on the roof and I'd put my toes over the edge and I'd see how far out I could lean until I felt my center of gravity. And the reason I didn't jump 
is because I remember reading one time about a man who jumped nine stories, but he hit some trees and landed on some cars, and he lived, but he was paralyzed. I thought, well, that's even worse. I thought I could jump, and what if I don't die? And so I was afraid it wouldn't work. I know another time my mother took sleeping pills, and she was out one night. I'm alone. I'm in trouble all the time, and I'm, I'm unhappy. I'm always bad grades, and, and I went into my mother's bathroom in her medicine cabinet. I found a bottle of pills that said, take one at bedtime, Valium. And I said, I just want to go to sleep and never wake up. You ever felt that way? And so I filled my hands with the pills, and I was getting ready. I got the water, getting ready to swallow all these pills and just go to sleep and end it all. But then it occurred to me, it did not say sleeping pills on the bottle. It said, take one at bedtime, Valium. And I was 13 at the time. I wasn't sure what Valium was. I thought, what if Valium is like a pill for ladies? And I thought, then what could happen to me? I took a lot of this. And so I thought, I better not do that. And so I put that away. Then I saw a beer commercial. I don't know if any of you remember the old Schlitz beer commercial. It said, you only go around once in life. Get all the gusto you can. And I thought, okay, that's my new motto. If I'm going to die, why die by jumping off a building or taking pills? I'm going to just have, I, I'm going to live as exciting a life as I can and go out with a bang. And I started getting into a lot of trouble. It wasn't just smoking pot or hash with mom or drinking. I could drink at home. When I was living with my father in his mansion there on the island, by the way, this is a picture of Sunset Island number one. I just took this off Google Earth. Dad's house was there on the water on the top. Had three bar boats, security guard to get on the island. And um, he had a bar in the house. I could drink all I wanted. And I'll, I'll just mention here that of all the drugs I've used, and I, I'd used just about everything, more of my friends died from alcohol than anything. I say that because I meet some Christians who think a little alcohol is okay. One out of seven people that drinks becomes an alcoholic. Would you keep a dog that bit one out of seven people that came to your house? Christians shouldn't drink. If nothing else, it's because it's a bad witness for other people. So I would drink. And the thing was that we had a butler and a maid at the house, and so I'd drink during the day while Dad was at work with my friends. The butler would be out working in the yard, and the butler would come in and say, oh, it looks like Mr. Bachelor's stock is down. He'd restock it. My father never knew it was missing. So we drank a lot. And when I was with mom, I knew where she kept her pot. She kept it in the spice rack. And so not only did I smoke with her, but I used to take some extra. And so I started using drugs. I started breaking into homes and stealing. And when I was living with my father on the Sunset Islands, my friends, you ever heard of Firestone Tires? I used to date Amy Firestone. You ever heard of Hoover Vacuum Cleaners? Sandy Hoover, we used to play with him. He lived on the island. And I could start naming these different people, multimillionaires, and they were our friends. And we all got in trouble together. We would get bored, all these rich, spoiled kids. And we, what do you want to do? And if it wasn't drugs, LSD or drinking or something, we'd say, let's break into a home just for the excitement. And we started breaking into the homes of the other millionaires. They'd dare me to do something. I'd do anything just for attention. And the sad thing was there was a raft of burglaries on the island, and so the, the millionaires were calling the police. They figured that these thieves were coming by boat, and we used to see the police boats circling the island looking to catch the thieves. It was the kids of the millionaires on the island stealing from each other. <laughs> and during this time, no satisfaction, no happiness. I just began to get into more and more trouble. My mother said, George, Doug needs more freedom. Military school has been too restrictive. He needs to express himself. My mother was an artist, you know. She found a school in upstate New York, or in Maine, where there was no rules. It was called a free school. This is one of the only pictures I've got. I'm the one at the bottom with his legs crossed and long hair. I know it's a muddy picture, but that's all I could get offline. It was called Pine Hinge. It was an experimental school. 
It lasted five years. The experiment failed. <laughs> the idea was, don't make the children do anything. Let them be free. You don't have to go to class if you don't want to. You don't have to go to meals if you don't want to. The school really only had three rules. There's no fighting, no drugs, no sex. Do you think the kids listened to the three rules? <laughs> there were co-ed dorms for all ages. We had kids from 8 to 18. It was crazy. I'm surprised it was legal. But I went to this free school. You can look it up online if you think I'm kidding, friends. So talk about mixed up. I went from the strictest school in North America, New York Military Academy, a rule for everything. And I praise God I went to that school because, man, you can ask Karen, I fold my underwear still. Well, she folds it too. But I make the bed in the hotel room. We check out of the hotel room, I make the bed. And then I went to a school, no rules. And a lot of kids attempted suicide. I learned you have to have discipline in your life or you cannot have happiness. If you don't have self-control, you will not succeed. So I got into a lot of trouble. By the time, first time I ran away from home, I was 16 years of age. No, 13 years of age. I stole from my mother, took a bus to upstate New York, got in a tent, and I'm by myself. I'm going, okay, now what, what do I do? And I got lonely. I eventually came home. Ran away again when I was 14 years of age with a friend. By the way, I met this friend years later. He became a colonel in, in the uh, uh, army. It was really interesting. And uh, he and I ran away, got arrested in Pennsylvania on the train, brought, flew us back to New York. We escaped again, moved up to the mountains, got arrested again. My mother said to my dad, I can't handle him anymore. She sent me to live with my dad. I got in trouble with my stepmother, said he's impossible, he can't stay at home. My dad also owned a hotel. He moved me into his hotel. I, I was so mixed up, I got arrested. I've been arrested seven times. I was in jail at one point for a week before I told them my real name. I thought I'd rather be in juvenile hall than back home in the mansion. Isn't that crazy? That's how unhappy I was. Just totally out of control. Finally, my dad said, I don't know what to do with you. Everybody thought, Dad, don't you want to work for your father? Get an education. Take over the business. Look at all the money you'll have. Look at all the things you'll have. I said, yeah, and I'll drink myself to sleep every night like him. What profit is it? They're not happy. So I said, Dad, I, I don't know what to do. He said, I don't know what to do. I just walked out of my dad's office. I got on the highway, Interstate 95. I started to hitchhike. I'm 16 years old. I went up to Boston. I had faked my driver's license. It said, in case you're curious, I'm bored in 1957. My mother's an artist. I took the seven. I made it a two. And I used that to get a phony ID, a real one, that said I was much older than I was. So I was able to get a driver's license, and I was able to get a job as a security guard. I was in Boston. And I was breaking into homes and stealing, stealing televisions, stealing cars, and working as a security guard at night. <laughs> Worked for a company called Business Intelligence. Now, I never stole from the place I guarded because, you know, they paid me. And I did my stealing during the day because if you walk out of a house during the day with a television, they think you're moving. Yep. Yep. So, during this time, my dad flew. Well, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, something happened. I had a friend named Jerry. He was a security guard. He found out about my day job stealing. I said, you're going to turn me in? He said, he was very spiritual. He's into these Eastern religions. He says, no, man, I don't got to turn you in. Your karma is going to get you. I said, what do you mean karma? He said, whatever you do comes back. I said, oh, there's, there's no God. I said, I stole that TV set and I got rid of it. Nothing happened. Nothing will happen. He said, you'll see. And a few days after we had that conversation, I woke up in my apartment in Boston. My door was open and I looked and my TV was gone. <laughs> and my radio. And I was mad. You know what I did? I called the police. <laughs> and I said, what is this city coming to? 
I said, you guys get out there and find them. And I started watching and everything I did seemed to backfire. I would go and steal something and my friends were thieves. They then steal it from me. Or I'd steal something while I was drinking or high and I'd hide it and I'd wake up and say, no, I know I hid the money. Where did I hide it? I remember with my friend, Jay Samuels, I was in Brooklyn stealing and the police found out and we were chased by the police and shot at. And I mean, I can tell you all these different stories, but it, everything was going wrong. I stole a car in Boston, drove down to New York City, got a flat tire, couldn't get in the trunk, could steal the car, but I couldn't get in the trunk to change the tire. Had to hitchhike from New York City back to Boston in the rain, miserable. And I started thinking, maybe there's a God. But you know what convinced me? It was a small thing. I didn't just quit stealing cold turkey. I tried to taper off. Because I said, you know, this karma thing, there may be something to it. I'd like steal a stereo and I'd get back to my house huffing and puffing and plug it in. It's broken, a broken stereo. So I went to someone's house and I stole a box of Krusty's Instant Pancake Mix, a brand new box. I did it because I was very health conscious back then. I was a hippie, you know. I just want whole wheat pancake mix. I'm drinking, smoking, using drugs, but just whole wheat pancake mix because I'm going to take care of myself. So I stole this box of pancake mix on the top of the box. This is before they had the barcode. It was stamped $1.19. I got back to my place that same day. Some people came to my place uninvited. I had a brand new jar of Tang instant breakfast drink. They took the jar, opened it up. They drank every bit of it. And there by the empty jar was a lid and it said $1.19. And I looked at the pancake mix and I said, crime doesn't pay. There must be a God. But I wasn't interested in Christianity. I'd spend too much time looking at Christians. And I said, they're all hypocrites. You know, I'd been to enough religious services and went to Catholic school and I remember the priest standing up there doing communion while he's smoking and drinking. I'm going, What's with this? And uh, I just, I turned on the news and said the Catholics and Protestants are killing each other in Ireland. I said, they both claim to be Christians. I thought Jesus said, love your enemies. They're blowing each other up. They're all hypocrites. I made the mistake many people make. When I wanted to know what a Christian was, I looked at Christians. If you want to be a Christian, don't look at Christians. Amen. Amen. A Christian is not a follower of Christians. A Christian is a follower of Christ. People will let you down. Jesus will not let you down. Amen. Keep your eyes on Christ. If you're going to look at people, the devil will get someone for you to look at that will disappoint you. Jesus will not disappoint you. Amen. So I said, they're all hypocrites. So I was, you know, this is during the Beatles era. And so I, I began to get into the Eastern religions. And I, I got into meditation and Buddhism. And I got into transcendental meditation and uh, yoga. That's where you look for God by standing on your head. And all I found was my hair fell out when I did that. And then I, you know, I was a little bit into Hinduism and I knew something about the Judaism and I got a little bit into the, the Kabbalah and some of the mystic sciences. And I kind of made a hodgepodge of all these different religions. I was looking for the truth. I even went to Southern California. I was hitchhiking around the country. I hitchhiked from Florida to California and back. I went all over. I went to a Hare Krishna temple in Santa Monica, California because they promised a free meal if you went to their service. You know, I went to the Christian mission. We were living on the streets back then. I was too proud to ask my dad for help. And the Christian mission said if you come in, they'd close the doors and all these drunks and, and derelicts would come in and addicts and they said we'll give you a free meal but you have to listen to the preaching then we feed you. Fair enough. So we'd sit there and I felt bad because all of my friends we were all so obnoxious and these Christians were so nice. They'd be sharing testimonies and they'd preach a little sermon and they'd bring out really nice food with apple pie and I mean it was great. We'd say oh we'll see you next week. Hare Krishna said we'll offer you free food if you come to our service. I said okay so I went with my friend Jay and the service involved jumping up and down. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm just telling you what happened. Jumping up and down and saying, 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. I never forgot that because they did it for two hours. <laughs> over and over. And I'd spent enough time in Hollywood with friends that were into, you know, hypnosis and stuff. I thought, this is just hypnosis. This repetition puts you in a state of hypnosis. And I told my friend Jay, I said, I'm going to the bathroom. I said, tell me when the food comes out. I said, I'm... <laughs> I stepped out and I'm in the bathroom and they got the drums going and the bass and they're all Hare Krishna Hare Krishna. I go in there and check on my friend Jay and he's he's getting into it. <laughs> they gave us yogurt and raisins for all of that. So, but I was searching for God. You know, I, I was trying everything. I thought there there must be a God. Well, I went back to Boston. And my father flew from Florida up to see me. And he begged me, he said, Doug, you got to go back to school. He said, you know, Falcon is sick. He's barely making it through college because the people are smoking and, and uh, he's struggling. He had to keep going to the hospital and having therapy. And, and he said, you're healthy. He says, you need to get an education. Don't waste your life. He said, I found a school. I said, I'm not going back to military school. There's no girls. And he said, no, no, there's girls. He said, I found a school. It's on a boat. It's actually two boats together. They sail around the world. And they have girls. You can scuba dive. You can water ski. You can go spear fishing. You can have some adventures. See the world. And he's begging me. He said, you know, I've got a briefcase here. It's got a million dollars in it. I'm getting ready to make a million dollar deal. And he said, you, you can have this business. You can work with me. Get an education. I said, all right. My father got me. Uh, I went to, I don't know how he got a passport. You know, if you have enough money, you can get a passport in one day. In fact, I think I showed you a picture a minute ago. It was my passport picture from, I was 16 years old. My dad got that. He flew me to Milan, Italy to join up on the boat. School was already in session. I joined late. And it was called the Flint School Abroad. If you want to look it up, friends, some people doubt the story. Now, this is actually a picture of the school. Two boats, sailboats. They sailed together. They went around the world. School was on the boat. And my father handed them my passport. He said, I'll see you later. And then I found out I kind of been tricked. It was a special school for the children of politicians and millionaires that had gotten mixed up on drugs or with cults to get them out of that influence. And then they taught atheism. They showed films on Darwin. They said, there is no God. You've got to make your own life. This is your only life. You've got to be success. And, and now I'm meditating. Now I'm into Shakti, the spiritual science of DNA. I was into, and I'm in my room meditating. I learned an interesting experience. We sailed around the Mediterranean and, you know, I had some experiences and you have to read the book there's just not time to tell it all but I, I noticed one time we were going from northern Africa Tunis Africa over to Port of Mahone Spain and the Mediterranean looks small on a map but you get out there in the middle and it's a big ocean you don't see land for days and we got into a winter storm it was during Christmas and water began to come over the edge of the boat and everything underneath the boat looked like it had been shaken apart and the wind was blowing like a hurricane, so the sail was cracking so loud that it sounded like thunder clapping. And you could yell at a person 10 feet away and they couldn't hear you. And the nose of the boat was going through waves and things were washing overboard and the water was cold. And the captain told us, if you fall overboard, we cannot turn around in the storm or we will capsize. We will mark the place where we lost you. That'll settle your nerves. And everybody was seasick. And the captain was seasick. And the mainsail ripped. What do you think atheists do when they think they're going to die? <laughs> Nobody was going, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. <laughs> People were praying. They're talking to God. They're confessing their sins. They know what they've done wrong because they're promising God they'll never do it again if he gives them another chance. And I was praying and making promises. Now, is that the right reason to serve God? You know, it might be a good starting point. Some people turn to God out of fear. It's not the best reason. 
the reason to serve God is if you love him? If the only reason you're serving God is because you're afraid he's going to punish you, then you won't want to serve him in heaven. You want to serve him because you love him now. You really love him. Amen. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, we survived the storm. And I convinced the captain to let me go home. Uh, I was being a real troublemaker, but he said, Doug, what do we need to do to get you to cooperate? I said, you let me go home for Christmas break and I'll obey the rules. I wasn't going to class. I wasn't doing my stuff on deck. They, in military school, you misbehave, they beat you. They couldn't do that on this school. And so I said, you, you let me go home Christmas. He got on the phone right there and he called my dad, woke him up because of the time change. So, oh, Mr. Bachelor, sorry to bother you. We've got good news. Doug has shown remarkable progress. We're gonna, we think he's ready to go home Christmas. Oh, my dad was thrilled. As Soon as I got on the plane in Madrid, Spain, I said, I'll take a beer. I want a pack of cigarettes. You could smoke on the plane back then. My friend said, oh, you're in trouble. I said, you guys are never going to see me again. And they never did. As Soon as I got to Florida, I took off hitchhiking. I went on vacation first with the family, snow skiing up in Canada, and then I came back. And when it came time to go back to school, I got on the freeway. I sold all my stuff to my brother. He didn't know I was going to run away. I just thought I need some spare change. I got on the road. I started hitchhiking from Florida to California. I wanted to go live in the mountains and find God through the American Indian religions. And Halfway out, I got stuck. It's wintertime in Oklahoma. And I was freezing. I'm by myself. I had been drinking the day before at a bar. I lost all my money at a pool hall, playing pool, making dumb bets, drunk. I'm broke. I'm sick. I'm hungry. And then I'm standing on the road, and I've got Florida clothing on, and it is below zero, and I'm freezing to death. Too stubborn and proud to ask for help. And every time a truck went by, three seconds later, I'd turn around because the wind from the truck would hit you. And after hours, I became desperate and I prayed. I said, God, I know there's a God. I was convinced now there was a God because of karma. You know, Jesus teaches karma. He says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What goes around comes around, friend, I can tell you. Blessed are the merciful, they will obtain mercy. And I said, I believe there's a God. I said, Lord, I asked him for four things. I said, will you please help me get a ride to where I'm going? I said, I'm freezing. I said, Lord, will you forgive me? I've been a rotten person, I know. I mean, I, I really was a pretty bad person. And I said, Lord, help me get some money. I was broke. Help me get a food. And I guess the fifth thing I prayed for is a ride with someone normal <laughs> because I kept getting picked up by crazy people. I got picked up by people that would, they were drinking, and they're on a windy road. They said, watch this, I can drive with the lights off. And they turn off their lights. <laughs> I got picked up by two college students that were smoking so much pot, the car was filled with smoke, they ran across the median into oncoming traffic. I said, oh, this is my stop, let me out. <laughs> so I said, Lord, give me a ride with someone normal. I'd been there for hours. As soon as I finished praying, I didn't know how to pray. I didn't say, in Jesus' name. I said, Lord, please help me. A vehicle stopped. White van. Picked me up. This man took me from Oklahoma to my destination in Palm Springs, California. He gave me $40 when he dropped me off. He fed me all the way out. I was hungry. Every time he fed me, I said, I've got no, money, no problem. I'll pay for it. And the thing I didn't pay, pray for is he preached to me all the way from Oklahoma to California. <laughs> he was a born-again Christian, and he was preaching to everybody along the way, and I had to kind of like listen to him or jump out of the car. <laughs> and I thought, Bible's a fairy tale. Christians are hypocrites. So he let me off, and I went up into the mountains. This is actually a picture my brother took years later. I wanted to now find God through nature. I moved up in the mountains and I moved into a cave. And I lived up in these deserted mountains way back up in the desert mountains. Karen's been up there a couple of times with me. Way up above Palm Springs, you go back down the other side, there's an oasis. 
and almost no one knows about it. During COVID, I went back up with my 25-year-old son at the time and uh, barely made it. It's hard to get to. 11,000-foot mountain there. It's called uh, Mount San Jacinto. And I lived in a cave for a year and a half. I took off all my clothes because now I'm going to find God through nature. Friends, this was the 70s. Flower children, it was crazy. I know it doesn't make any sense. I would hike down to town once a week to Palm Springs. I'd play the flute and I'd panhandle. And I'd get food out of the garbage can behind the market. My father found out from my grandfather I was a dumpster diving. And it broke his heart. He worked all through the Depression so his kids would never be poor. And now he finds out his son is digging in the garbage for food. You know, you've got a heavenly father that gave his son Jesus so that you could be rich. And we go to the devil's dumpster and it breaks his heart. Well, here's a miracle. I was living up in the mountains in this cave. Here's a picture of my cave. I had a cat named Stranger. I know the pictures are a little rough. Here's my cat. Had a pool right outside my cave with a waterfall. It's a beautiful spot. Somebody had left a Bible in the cave. I thought, I'm going to read the Bible so I can argue with Christians because I kept meeting these converted hippies and we called them Jesus freaks back then. You know, they had the Jesus movement back then. And I'd argue with them. And they'd talk about sanctification and washed in the blood. And I thought, these people are crazy. But I didn't know the Bible, so I thought, well, I need to at least, I was a good reader. I, I need to read the Bible. Well, I'll tell you what, friends, that's a dangerous business. I started reading the Bible. I got bogged down there in Exodus, and I jumped, and I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Every day I'd eat banana bread because I'd get the day-old bananas from the market for free. The guys at the market knew me. And I'd eat banana bread. I had a Dutch oven I put on the fire. And then I'd eat the bread of life. And I read through the Bible. And somewhere along the way, something happened. Amen. I tried everything. I looked at all the religions of the world. I had no prejudice. I mean, I could have been anything. I didn't care. I just said, I want to know the truth. And as I'm reading the Bible, I'm going, this can't be true. Noah and the ark and Adam and Eve and but a voice inside said this is the truth this is the truth I said but Jesus didn't really live he's a legend I went down to the library and I said no he lived we date history from his birth and finally I said well I've only got one of three choices I said either he was a liar or he was a lunatic or he's the Lord and I knew he wasn't a liar because everything he said, you know, as I'm reading the Bible, first time I'm reading the Bible, it says, turn the other cheek. I said, oh, I've used that expression. I didn't know Jesus said that. Going the second mile, handwriting on the wall, by the skin of your teeth, all these things I've been hearing all my life. I said, this Bible's a pretty good book. It's got a lot of wisdom in here. Jesus could have told a lie and saved himself, but he didn't. I said, I know he wasn't crazy. People who came listening to Jesus said, no man has ever talked like this man. Amen. We don't even know what he looked like. What he said has changed the world. He said, my teachings are going to the whole world. And right now, most of the world claims Christianity. Amen. I said, I've tried everything else. So up there in the mountains in this deserted cave, I knelt down and got on my knees. I said, Lord, I am a mess. I'm like that demoniac. I'm running around naked up in the mountains, eating out of the garbage can, living an unclean life. And I said, will you forgive me? Will you give me some purpose for living? And you know, I prayed that prayer. I felt the peace come into my heart. And I didn't change in one day, but God began to change me and miracles started to happen. I'll tell you, let me give you a quick story. I'm looking at the clock, and I'm going to go just a minute or two over. They, they told me I could do that. That man came to Jesus like he was. And the Lord said, he cast out the devils. And he said, I want to go with you, Lord. Jesus said, no, no, no. I want you to go tell other people what God has done for you. And he went and he told everybody that Jesus had broken his chains. 
And when Christ came back, there was a great multitude converted from that demoniac who had been set free from the devil. The man that everybody else thought was the most hopeless man in the Bible, God used him. Amen. I'm up there in the cave, and after accepting Jesus, I said, Lord, this is good news. I can't wait. To, I we started telling everybody about Jesus. I, and I said, Lord, I'm feeling like you're wanting me to do this full time. But I'm a hermit. I'm afraid of people. You can ask Karen. I can go to the mountains for days all by myself, and I'm happy. And I said, you want me to stand in front of people and talk to people about you, so I'll do it, Lord, if that's what you want me to do, but you're going to have to show me. So I said, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm by myself up in the mountains, but if you want me to witness for you, I need a sign. I go to town the next few days. I call my mother, collect in Beverly Hills. I was checked in. Mom, I'm alive. I'm fine. She says, Doug, are you going to be home in the next few days? I said, what do you mean home? Up at the cave? Yeah, I'll be at the cave. She says, I want to come see you. I said, Mom, you can't make it. She said, I'm coming in a helicopter. I said, what? She said, yeah, I was having dinner with a guy from NBC News, Bill Applegate. And he, I said, my son's father is a multimillionaire and he's living in the mountains in a cave. He said, that'd be a great human interest story. Would he let us tape him? She said, I don't know. I'll ask next time he calls. So I said, all right. So my mother flies from Los Angeles. They rent a helicopter. They fly up to my cave to interview me and ask me, why am I doing this? And I have an opportunity now to briefly share my testimony. Amen. This is a picture of them in my cave. They had a film crew that took this picture. <laughs> I never knew that picture would be the cover of the book someday or the pictures that the photographer took that day. And after they flew away in the helicopter, I had to go down to town and ask if I could go into the hotel lobby and they said, what for? I said, I'm going to be on the news. <laughs> I was on the news, national news, three times that day sharing my testimony. I know three times because a friend in jail said he saw it three times. <laughs> so now, and just in case you're wondering, I'm a pastor. I get a pastor's salary. People hear about my dad and they come and ask me about investments. My father left the bulk of his money to a foundation, a good foundation, the Bachelor Foundation. Karen and I live in a regular house. We are normal people, but I am happy. Amen. I travel around, I share the gospel. One more thought before I pray with you. Just before my brother died, Falcon, he used to walk around the golf cars there in Miami Beach. He was a good boy. He went to college and he stayed home and he worked for dad. He had a new home on the water, had a, boats in the backyard and all the toys, but he was sick. And I was walking with him one day and he would stop and have a coughing fit. Then we'd walk a little more and he said, Doug, you're lucky. I said, what do you mean? He said, I would give everything I have if I could have your lungs. He said, life is not fair. He said, I'm so smart, but I'm sick. He said, and you're so healthy, but you're stupid. <laughs> he said, I would give everything if I could have your lungs and live a little longer in this life. And I think about people who will not give up anything for Jesus in everlasting life. And I was by my brother's side holding his hand before he died. And I said, Falcon, can I pray with you? He used to tease me because of my religion. But when he was dying, he wasn't making fun of my religion. He said, yes, and he squeezed my hand. And I asked him to accept Jesus into his heart. What profit is it if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? Friends, it's not money. It's not fame. It's got not good looks. Jesus has a big plan for each one of you, but you've got to come to him just like you are, Amen. and you can do that now. I'd like to pray for you. And before we close this part of our service today, you know, Jesus is coming back, and he wants you to be ready. There may be some of you here now and you have not given Jesus first place in your life. Some of you watching. 
You know, you're distracted with the things of the world. This life is short, friends. It goes by fast. And I'd like to ask, if you'd like to say, by standing in his presence, do it because you mean it. If you have not accepted Jesus before, or if you have not fully surrendered your life to him, and you would like to do that now, are you willing to stand in God's presence and say, I hear his voice. I want to do that now. I see you standing. Yes, stand. Don't be afraid. Jesus died for you publicly. You can come to him publicly. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. There's others. Before I pray, if you want to make your decision. Amen. Some at home, you can pray wherever you are. Say, Lord, I want to give you everything right now. Come just like you are. That demoniac, he came just like he was, and Jesus set him free. He can set you free and put you to work. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your miraculous power to save. Help us to have the priorities of seeking first your kingdom. I pray that we'll not be distracted by the deceptions of the enemy. Whatever the chains are in the lives of these people, as you did for that man, break the chains, set us free, cover our nakedness with your robe, and give us a work to do. Bless the people here and bless these meetings, the remainder, and pour out your spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.